بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As of where we ended last time We mentioned the false prophet Tulayh al-Azdi And how he used to be a sahabi And then after he had that honor of meeting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam After the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died He claimed prophethood for himself so he completely disbelieved and apostatized from the religion of Islam then Khalid ibn Walid Allah sent Khalid to him as a mercy and Khalid destroyed his army and he defeated Tulayha al-Azdi but he did not kill Tulayha so Tulayha went to Iraq and he went to the region towards Persia and that direction and we mentioned that he performed Umrah during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an and he had become Muslim once again and Abu Bakr knew that he became Muslim and he left him and he did not retaliate upon him because only Allah knows the reality of his Iman and therefore we can take a lesson that yes it is possible for somebody to be in such a high position of Iman and then he comes back after reaching such a high peak of being a Sahabi, then he can go as far as being the polar opposite and he becomes not merely a Kafir, but the leader of a Kafir cult, a false prophet, someone who leads people astray from the guidance after they have come to know about it. But then it doesn't end there. Tulayh al-Azdi's story continues. And then after he became a Muslim yet again, during the Khilafah of Umar down the line, but it's important to mention just to learn about how the hearts change and how one day a person can be steadfast on Islam, then he can become a kafir and then he can die the best of deaths. And so during the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab al-Farooq radiallahu an, Tulayh al-Azdi exhibited magnificent feats of bravery and he was one of the best warriors the Muslims had in the conquest of Persia. And not only that, but in the end he died in the context of war and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept this Muslim as a shaheed and Allah knows the reality of his Iman. So now we move on and we mentioned earlier the miracle of Abu Muslim al-Khawlani. Abu Muslim al-Khawlani rahimahullah he was in Yemen and the false prophet Al-Aswad Al-Ansi tried to burn him alive. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a miracle, a karama, to strengthen his iman and to be a sign for those around him. And he did not allow the fire, the huge fire, to consume his body. And he walked out untouched and unburnt just as he entered the fire. So he was unaffected by the fire that was intended to kill him. So then he was exiled and he went to Medina and he met Abu Bakr and Umar Radwan Allahi alayhima. So now we have a similar story. And this is the story of Al Ala Al Hadrami Radiallahu An. And although he is not one of the most famous Sahaba, he is one of the very important ones. And we should all learn about his story. He was considered one of the scholars of the Sahaba. He was one of the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba. And he was from the Eastern Arabian Peninsula in the region called Bahrain. Now today Bahrain is just a small small area it's barely the size of a city you know right now it's just an island basically but back then it was much of the east coast of the Arabian Peninsula much of the east coast was considered to be the region of Bahrain so it, the terminology has changed over time but basically he was the leader of the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula and he was of course a governor under Abu Bakr Siddiq the Khalifa of the Muslims at that time so Abu Bakr appointed him in charge of taking care of the apostates in the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula and so Al Ala Al Hadrami took some of his men and he marched from Medina towards the direction of Bahrain in order to catch up with these apostates so they chased them and they chased them and then they finally caught up with them at night until they got into the middle of the desert and then they had finally set up camp and then out of nowhere Allah will that their camels all run away at the same time 
So they set up camp, they went to sleep, they woke up with all their camels. And all the supplies that they had on their camels, gone. And so within moments, they ran out of food and water and they were in the middle of the desert with no supplies whatsoever. An entire army without any resources, on the verge of death, in the path of Allah. So what happens? When things are already rough, they're already in a military context, a rough type of setting. Then, on top of this, all of their resources that attach them to any type of a normal life are taken from them. And now they have nothing left. Their camels all ran away at the same time. So what do they do? Al-Ala al-Hadrami, the great Sahabi radiallahu anh, he knows his position as a muwahid, one who has tawheed in Allah, as a slave of Allah. And what does he do? He tells his men to make dua. And so what he does is that he and his men stay up all night until Fajr and they pray Qiyam, they pray Tahajjud and they make dua to Allah. So they asked Allah, the one who created the heavens and the earth and the one to whom they will return and they will be judged according to their sins on the day of judgment. They ask the master of the universe, Allah Azza wa Jal, to do what is so simple for him to do. And all he has to do is to provide the word kun fayakun. He has to say be and it is. And so until Fajr, they stayed awake making dua and praying to Allah Azza wa Jal. And then finally, finally Allah Azza wa Jal caused a stream of water to appear out of the sand for them. And out of the desert, the dry, arid desert, a stream of water appeared by the permission of Allah. And it was so extensive and abundant out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the entire army drank their fill and they bathed and they made wudu and they cleansed themselves. And then when it couldn't get any better, their camels all came back and their supplies came back to them. And their camels even drank their fill. A miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A karama. A miracle that is given to the Muslims. The normal, typical, ordinary Muslims. This is not prophets. Just like it can be given to a Sahabi. It has been given to Tabi'een. It has been given to normal Muslims. Generations later, it is given to Muslims in our times. Wallahi. Wallahi, it's given to Muslims in our times who face extreme hardships in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah does not forsake His servants. If you are willing to risk your life in order to defend the cause of Allah, Allah will not throw you into destruction because of this. Allah will protect you. Allahu waliyyu alladheena amanu. Allah is the protector of those who have believed. And so Allah Azza wa Jal gave them a miracle. Out of the arid dryness of the desert, at night, they were granted a flowing river of water from which they could quench their thirst and cook and do bathe and do wudu. Not even tayam, wudu. They can do wudu now. And not even their camels came back to them and their camels drank their fill. So whoever has taqwa in Allah, yes, you will be tested. Wallah al-Azim, you will be tested. But Allah will make things easy for you. And when you have patience and you put your trust on none other than Allah, on only the one who created you, Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will make your affairs right. And that is the iman and tawakkul a Muslim must have to call themselves a believer in Allah. So then they proceeded and they continued their march against the apostates. And so they caught up with the apostates very shortly after at night time. And so the apostates did not expect the arrival of the Muslims. So they were partying and feasting and having what they considered to be a very good time. And so they got drunk and they were consumed with alcohol and intoxicants. And because of this, because of these dangers which Allah Azza wa Jal has prohibited for them, they transgressed the limits. Of course, their kufr was much greater a sin than any alcohol could ever be. But they continued in their disobedience until they caused their own destruction. So because they were drunk, the Muslims 
under Al Ala and Hadrami radiallahu an, they made the move. They decided this is the best time to go after them. Because if we wait until they're sober, they'll be able to focus more and they will be able to strategize and prepare for us. But now that they're drunk, all they really care about is whatever parties they're partaking in right now. So they're completely disorganized, they're unprepared, and they are lost out of their minds. So they attacked at night while they were drunk and they put an end to this army. It was truly a victory from Allah Azza wa Jal. And this army that was drunk and diseased mentally because of what they had done to themselves, Allah Azza wa Jal gave yet another victory to the believers. Walillahi alhamd. So alhamdulillah, as a result of the miracles of Allah in taking these filthy kafir sinners when they least expected it, and of course because of their own transgression and their violation of the laws of Allah in intoxicating themselves, Allah Azza wa Jal decreed that they would be eliminated in this battle and they were destroyed because of their own intoxication. And so, there was a small remainder of this group that was not killed, and so they fled for their lives. So what happened was Ala al-Hadrami radiallahu an and his men, they chased after them. But they got a head start because they, as soon as the Muslims began to attack, they left right away. So the Muslims were focusing on, you know, taking care of the larger group that had not fled. So that gave them some time to flee closer to the coast in Bahrain, which we said is the eastern coast of the Arabian Peninsula. And so they moved steadily and steadily towards the coast until they almost got to the sea. And during this time, Al Ala Al Hadrami was finishing off those who remained at the campsite of the apostates. So when they finished with the main camp of the apostates, Al Ala Al Hadrami and his men, may Allah have mercy on all of them. They chased after them and they went and they tried to catch up. But there was such a great distance between them that it was almost impossible under normal circumstances for them to catch up and get them in a normal way. So what happened was the apostates got onto a ship and they set out to sea. They got onto a ship and they set out to sea. But if Al Ala Al Hadrami and his larger army were to do the same, were to first purchase a ship to get on or to even rent one or borrow one from someone and then on top of that to load it and to man it and to when they are not essentially as prepared or expecting such a maneuver to be part of the chase after the apostates this would have taken even more time and by the time they caught up to the it would have been too late they would have never caught up to them or it would have been impractical to catch up with them so we mentioned the first miracle of Al Ala Al Hadrami but if I say there's a first miracle that means there has to be a second one too. And so alhamdulillah we learn of the second miracle of Al-Ala Al-Hadrami radiallahu ta'ala an. And he and his men lined up as an army at the coast by the Persian Gulf. And they looked out to sea. And far out to sea they knew that the apostates were on a ship far in that direction. And they were seemingly safe from the Muslims, but they were not safe from the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so Al Ala Al Hadrami, he said, if we get on a ship, we're not going to be able to catch up to them. They're too light, we're too big. They're going to be too fast to catch up to. And we have too much preparing to do. So what do they do? A bunch of guys in the desert, on the coast, on their horsebacks. What do they do? They say, Bismillah. And they set out on horseback, riding on top of the surface of the water. Riding as if it was sand or a paved surface. And they would say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. They would praise the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. The one who in an instant can command the sea to swallow them whole. Allah allowed them to walk on the surface of the water as if it were paved. And so they galloped and they galloped until they caught up to the, the ships of the apostates, the Murtaddin. And they got onto the ships and they killed every last one of, of the apostates. And they brought back the booty of war. And then they galloped right back. 
all the way back to the coast. And in this entire experience, not even the bellies of their animals got wet from riding on top of the water. So the first miracle we mentioned in the series, Fitan al ummah the Fitan of the Ummah, the tribulations of the Ummah, in this series of the apostate wars, was the miracle of Abu Muslim al-Khawlani, who received a similar miracle to the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And now we see a miracle similar to that of Musa alayhi salam. But each one was unique. Musa, the sea split into two for him by the permission of Allah. In this case, the sea didn't even have to split into two. It merely maintained its form as the Muslims rode on top of it on horseback. As a reward for what they used to do. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوْعَدُونَ Allah says about those who said our Lord is Allah and then they remained steadfast despite the challenges that they faced. And truly, certainly, nothing in this world can be as great of a challenge as jihad fi sabilillah. And this is what it was against the internal enemy within the Arabian Peninsula, those filthy apostates who wanted to rebel against the righteous khilafah of Abu Bakr and the Sahaba Rudwan Allahi alayhim ajma'een. Allah made these people steadfast because they were willing to sacrifice everything they had for the sake of Allah. And then, when they did remain steadfast by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says about these people, تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels descend upon the ones who are steadfast on the path of Allah. And when the angels surround you, there is blessing that is associated with such a beautiful gathering. Allah blesses a gathering in which the angels are a part of it. You experience in some cases like this, miracles which take place. And don't get me wrong, not every time somebody says a miracle took place, did a real miracle actually take place. In fact, most of the time, many times, it is lies. But it is not far-fetched that when Muslims are in very tight spots, as we can call them, that when they are sacrificing everything for Allah, and they need Allah in order to strengthen their Iman, otherwise their Iman will fail. They need Allah to support them in their mission, otherwise they will fail. And their mission essentially, from the beginning to the end, is for the sake of Allah, then Allah will provide supernatural assistance not just as supernatural assistance not all the time but on rare occasions to remind the believers of the greatness of the one in whom they have iman walillahi alhamd and we've covered this walillahi alhamd when we spoke of albu muslim al khawlani and alhamdulillah i believe that sufficed and this story was narrated by ibn kathir and at tabari and it was told essentially by a former Christian, a Christian monk or a priest or its equivalent. He's the one who witnessed both miracles of Al-Ala Al-Hadrami. And because of this, he took his shahada. Allahu Akbar. Because of witnessing both miracles, he became a Muslim. And he said, I'm afraid that Allah would have turned me into an animal after what I have seen of his signs if I refuse to accept them. And he said, he heard the angels accompany the army of Al-Ala Al-Hadrami throughout their expeditions. We mentioned Tulayh Al-Azdi, we mentioned Al-Aswad Al-Ansi, and we mentioned their stories from beginning to the end, basically. And now we will continue on to the third out of four of the false prophets who emerged during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. And this is the first of the females. Of all of the female false prophets, this is the first. Whoever took place. 
And her name was Sujah. Sujah. And she came from a Christian background, a Christian tribe in Iraq. And she allied herself with Tulayha and Musaylam. So she at first began to call to her own prophethood, false prophethood. And then the people began to respond and respond and respond and began to form a cult around her. They're all cults. They don't even deserve to be called religions. These are all cults. And so they formed their own cults around her. And then she began to make political alliances with the other false prophets. So at first she allied herself with Tulayha al-Azdi. That didn't really work for so long. And then she moved on to bigger and better things. The bigger false prophet, Musaylam al-Kadhab. May Allah curse him. She allied herself with Musaylama after Tulayha was defeated. So who is Musaylama al-Kadhab? Musaylama la'natullahi alayhi. May Allah perpetually curse this man. Was essentially an Arab from the region of the Arabian Peninsula called Al-Yamama. His tribe was called Banu Hanifa, not to be associated with our brothers in the Hanafi Mathab. He was from a tribe called Banu Hanifa. This was a very strong, very well established tribe. It was very powerful, its fighters were notoriously strong, and it was a very, very influential tribe in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, to give you a background of his story, from his youth, he was known for studying sorcery, just like Al Aswad Al Ansi. He would study sorcery, and he had connections with the jinn from very early on in his times. And he would establish these relations. Basically, with, when, when people have relations with the jinns, we're not talking about, you know, just a friendship, you know, I love you, you love me. They would do each other favors. You know, the one, the human being would do types of worship oftentimes to the jinn, and the jinn in return would give him what would appear to be supernatural advantages over other human beings. For example, the jinn would command the sorcerer, like Musaylam al kadhab or anyone similar to him, to write the Qur'an in blood and then to do disgusting things like defecate on it to do horrible things, things that are kufr pure kufr in its essence and then in return for this the jinn would respond if the person needed a favor so the person would say I need you to make this person sick or to help him lose his mind or to drive him to insanity or to make him hate his wife or something along those lines, or sometimes to even go as far as killing him. And then the jinn would respond based on how intimate the relationship would be, based on how well the relationship has developed. And so Musaylam al kadhab was one of these people. And so he studied sorcery, and because of this, he would perform fake miracles in front of the people. Some of it was optical illusions. He would always study how to deceive people. That's so opposite to the character of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi from before he was even a prophet he was known as being a sadiqul amin the truthful one the honest and the trustworthy one that was Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this man from his youth he was known for being someone who's deceiving people and tricking them and trying to delude their senses making them see something other than the reality or making the jinn entirely in, you know, drive these people out of their minds. So complete opposite backgrounds. And of course, one day he got very excited. And he decided to call to the prophethood for himself. But let's take a look at it. Why did he do this? What drove him to it? What was his inspiration? Originally, originally, he wanted to become very influential and powerful and gain this influence for himself. And so he decided that after seeing the success of the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu he alayhi wa he would attempt a similar move and he would call to a fake prophethood for himself. And then he had someone, a companion of his, who helped him in this path. His name was Ar-Rajjal ibn Anfuwa. May Allah curse him as well. Ar-Rajjal was a student of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he studied the Quran at the hands and the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in fact he became very well versed in the Quran so time passed on and he was actually from Banu Hanifa but he went and he sat with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to learn hands on directly from the Messenger of Allah the revelation of the Creator Azza wa Jal and so time went on and he was about to go back to Banu Hanifa, to the tribe in which Musaylam al kadhab was preaching his kufr. And before he left, Rasulullah gave him a message. He gave him a message and he told Ar-Rajjal ibn Anfuwa 
to tell his people that Musaylam al-Kathab was a liar and this is being confirmed by the authentic messenger of Allah Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what happened? Al-Rajal ibn Anfuwa turned out to be more of an evil fasiq, fajir, zalim, kafir, even than Musaylam al-Kathab himself. And what he did when he arrived at Banu Hanifa, he said, I have been sent by Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to confirm the co-prophethood of Musaylam al-Kathab. He absolutely lied against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we give him glad tidings of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who authentic has been narrated to have said مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مِقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever intentionally lies against me then let him choose his place in the fire. And that is exactly what this fasiq has done. And he says to the people that Musaylama is a prophet and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also a prophet. Musaylama al-Kathab, la'natullahi alayhi, he sent two men as messengers to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In this message, he said from Musaylama, Rasulullah, Musaylama, the Messenger of Allah, to Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The earth is split into two halves. One half belongs to you, and the other half belongs to me. But the Quraysh are people who are transgressing. For I have been given partnership with you. That's the message. He's saying that you own half the world, and I own half the world. But since you haven't given me my rightful half, you and your Quraysh guys, your tribe, are transgressing against my people. So this is like my warning to you to step down and give me what's rightfully mine. It's like he's threatening Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Think about this. Yani he's not even saying, may Allah allow you to rule the land peacefully. At least if you're going to be a false prophet, do it with some type of intellect, man. This guy, yani at least say, I hope you rule with justice. May Allah make the better of us rise above the other. Yani at least if you're going to fight him, do it with some chivalry. But he's doing it with aggressiveness. Yani you're, you're threatening Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When has there ever been... Yani even during the times when there were more than one prophet at one time. For example, Harun and Musa. Or during the time of any of the several cases in Bani Israel when many prophets were present at one time. Did they ever threaten each other? Absolutely not, of course not. But this guy, he doesn't even want to learn the basics, man. Learn some common sense, then call to your false prophethood. And it shows you, the reason people followed him, and he gained a massive following, and it grew exponentially from the time he began it, it was because of tribalism. It wasn't because that they actually believed in him. Just like Tulayha al-Azdi, just like al-Aswad al-Ansi. They don't care about these people. They don't care about the religion of Musaylam al They could care less. In fact, in fact, there was one person, and he said to Musaylam, he said, I... Know that you're a liar. I know you're lying. I know you're a false prophet. Okay? But a liar from my tribe is better than a truthful man from Quraysh. SubhanAllah. So he know he's, he's confirming that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is truthfully the messenger. But he is openly stating that he's willing to go against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to stick to his own tribe. Pure tribalism. And we already mentioned the dangers of tribalism and its modern day equivalent of nationalism. So inshallah we're not going to overlap. So Rasulullah sallam he receives this threatening, aggressive, inappropriate message from Musaylam al kadhab And what does he say? He asks the messengers who are responsible to give him this letter, what do you think about Musaylam? He asks them what their opinion is. Are you just being forced into, are you being coerced? Because that's not as bad as if you really believe in it. They said, we are from Banu Hanifa and we are with our tribe. In other words, we're with him to the death. And so Rasulullah Sallallahu responded and he said, had it not been for the fact that messengers are not killed, I would have killed you both. Because of how far they're crossing the lines and how clearly they are in the haram and the absolute wrong. They're, it's not even that they're convinced by this religion. It's that they know they're wrong. 
and they're still doing it out of tribalism. And that's the evil of it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responds to him in a very straightforward message. Like our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is known for. And so he doesn't respond by a very, in a threatening tone. He keeps his calm, his cool, his confidence, as we can expect from our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Min Muhammadin Nabi ila Musaylamat al From Muhammad the Prophet to Musaylama the liar. Amma ba'du fa inna al arda lillah yurithuha man yasha'u min ibadih wal aqibatu lil muttaqin. وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الْهُدَى As to what follows, then verily, the earth belongs to Allah, and He will grant it to whoever He wills from among His servants. And the final victory is for those who have taqwa. And peace goes to those who follow the guidance. That's it. That's the message. Straight Short, sweet, and beautiful. And it was recorded in Tariq al-Tabari. Sallallahu ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhanallah, oftentimes, this is uh, more of an analogy right now, the grammarians, those who study grammar and syntax and they study the meanings of words, they say if you want to know the meaning of something, then you study its opposite. If you want to know all about good, then you study evil so that you know exactly what is not characterized by good. So if you want to study what prophethood is, and you want to really love prophethood, and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all you need to do is to look at the filthy example of this kafir, and then you will appreciate even more than before the purity and the trustworthiness and the sincerity and the love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And may Allah Azza wa Jal unite us with him in Jannah. Allahumma ameen. And so this message was sent with a Muslim messenger, a Muslim mail carrier, if you want to call it so. And he arrived at Musaylama and he read the message to him. And so Musaylama, he did the same thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did to the two messengers of Musaylama al kadhab And he says, what do you think about Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, What do you think about me? Am I the messenger of Allah? He says, I can't hear you. <laughs> Remember, we had a similar discourse with Al Aswad. And he says, I can't hear you. And he asks him again about Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he asks, what about me? Do you believe I'm the messenger of Allah? He says, I can't hear you. And then he says, okay, you're going to play that game. That's fine. That's fine. I can play that game too. And then he cuts off a piece of his body. And then he asks the question again. He says, do you bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah? He says, ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he says, Do you bear witness that I am the messenger of Allah? He says, I can't hear you. He cuts off another piece of his body. And he keeps doing this until the man died in the way of Allah. And we ask Allah to accept him as a shaheed. And so look at this. Compare Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, I don't kill messengers to this filthy, arrogant scum who is killing the messenger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not just killing him, but torturing him, ruthlessly killing him, mercilessly, dishonoring his body even, until he finally dies. Compare that with a sadiq al-masduq, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very different. And you see, truth stands out very clearly from falsehood. Al-Musaylam al kadhab may Allah curse him, had this perverted twisted way of following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And 
his style of false prophethood was that he would look to what happens to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was known for doing and he would try to copy it himself and just like Al-Aswad Al-Ansi and Tulayh Al-Azdi they would make their own versions of the Quran because like the new cool thing to do is to make your own demented twisted version of the Quran and of course by the time it always comes out even if they were experts in poetry it would end up sounding like nonsense and we'll give you some examples now we mentioned with Tulayh Al-Azdi and Al-Aswad Al-Ansi that their fake Qurans and their fake revelations always sounded really really bad even though they were good at speaking and they were good at language and let's talk about exactly how bad it got one of the sur of the Quran is inna a'taynaka al-kawthar right Allah Azza wa Jal says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we have given you al-kawthar we have given you the river in Jannah that flows from the throne of al-Rahman throughout Jannah that's al-kawthar so Musaylam al-Kadhab he looks at the shortest surah of the Quran and he says you know what I'm gonna try to copy this one all right, go ahead. Let's see it. What happens? This one is three ayat. I'm going to make one with only two ayat. Right? So he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna a'taynaka al-muftah. Fasalli li rabbika wartah. He says, Verily, we have given you the key. The key to Jannah. So, pray to your Lord and kick back. Pray to your Lord and relax. Just chill out. That's what that's literally what it means. We've given you the key to the Jannah, so pray to your Lord and kick back. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. We needed a prophet to inform us of this revelation, to guide us from the darkness to the light. No no no, but mashaAllah, he has another one. And his other one is it's about frogs. So he says, O oh frog, crock as you crock, the bottom of you is in dirt, and the top of you is in water. <laughs> O oh frog, crock as you crock, the bottom of you is in dirt and the top of you is in water. And then he had another one too. It's called the harvesting surah. The harvesting surah. And so he says, planting seeds, then the seeds grow, and you harvest the grain, and then you crush it, and you make bread out of it, and you mix the bread with soup, eat from the soup with the bread. And so somebody said, he heard this and he says, Oh Musaylama, I'm not sure if your angel is descending on your heart or on your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Subhanallah. So this is what happens when you try to imitate the Quran. And he even tried to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in miracles that he would perform. You know, one time Isa alayhi salam, a blind man would come to him, he would put his hand on the eye of the blind man and he would be able to see. So one time somebody came to Musaylam al kadhab and he, was, he wasn't blind yet, but he was uh, complaining of problems with his vision. So Musaylama, he says, come here, come here, I got you, don't worry. He puts his hand on his, on his head and he says some type of prayer. And rather than the man walking out good as new, the man was completely blinded. Now he can't see at all. Oh, thanks a lot, man. That's great. Can't see at all now. One of his other miracles that he tried to perform was he made wudu. So he made wudu with some water, and then he poured the water over the trunk of a tree. And, mashaAllah, the tree dried up and it died. Another one that he had was that he went and he tried to make some dua for children. So he passed his hand over the heads of these children, and some of them went bald and others developed a lisp. And those were the miracles of al Musaylim al kadhab and these were recorded in al Bidayah and Nihaya by Ibn Kathir. And so you see the absolute absurdity in this man. But you can say, how can somebody really believe in this? This guy is he's a lunatic, he's out of his mind, and he's not even doing anything useful. All he's doing is giving people lisps, he's dementing their intellect, he can't even put poetry together without it sounding like, you know, he hasn't eaten in days. What is the benefit of this man? Why him? What's so special about him? And the thing is, there's nothing special about him at all. But in fact, it was tribalism that had overcome the people and it blinded them to the reality of their purpose in this dunya. And rather than them realizing that they have to follow the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, they were more willing to follow a crook, 
a filthy liar, a kafir known as Musaylam al kadhab if it meant that their tribe would be honored. And it wasn't honored. It was humiliated just as Allah Azza wa Jal promises to the enemies of Allah. One time, Amr ibn al-As, the Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he met Musaylam al kadhab before he actually became Muslim. So Amr ibn al-As, he would ultimately become a Sahabi, but during the time that he was still, uh, before he accepted Islam, he met Musaylam al kadhab He says, you know, I hear that you have your Qur'an, so do you mind reciting some of it to me? I want to know a little bit about it. So he recited probably the one about the frog, or maybe it was the one about the harvesting, Allah knows best whether he was hungry or not. And so, Hamad ibn Nas, he is just, he, is, he himself is a kafir. He's a mushrik at this time. But he listens to the nonsense that's coming out of this guy's mouth, and he says, Wallahi al-Azim, you know that I know you're a liar. He doesn't just say, Wallahi, you're a liar. He says, Wallahi, you know that I know you're a liar. Yeah, that's how bad it was, man. Absolute absurdity. But they followed him out of tribalism. And when we try to take lessons from learning of history, bringing it back to the modern times that we live in, the equivalent of tribalism today in most societies is extreme nationalism. You might have a sense of love for the region that you come from, for the culture, but when it blinds you or blurs your vision of why you're here, why you are a Muslim, why you were created, or it takes anything away, even in the least bit from your ibadah to Allah Azza wa Jal, then you need to take a step back. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, walhamdulillahi rabbi.